when the people, the locals, people trying to, move, they were moving the car, you know? Like, uh, if you don't pay, we're gonna hurt you. Knowing the, the locals, and you know, feed you up, and feed you with a nice spark of life. This is my advice. Did you accomplish this in a minivan? Yes, correct. Yeah. listening to the GHT Overland Podcast. We are super stoked to bring you this week's episode. We took a little break last week as the spring weather in the Pacific Northwest unexpectedly gave us a few days of sun in a row. So that was kind of cool. Our property required some serious scotch broom eradication. So we basically dropped everything to tackle that little monster. And although hillsides of bright yellow can be beautiful, we're hoping to return to no yellow in a few months to see our little fir trees exploding with growth. Next week, it's a root canal for me, so I will do my best to get the episode out. It's recorded, ready to roll. We're just going to have to wait to see what happens. Okay, so this week is quite possibly the most impressively creative, modest overlander to date. We often hear from guests about people they know still planning, still building, still doing dot, 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 you fill in the blank. That said, we also have great appreciation for the wisdom passed on by Mary of Monkeys on the Road, if you remember episode 112. And I think at least one other past guest quite a long time ago said basically the same thing, that throwing all caution to the wind may not be the best solution for everyone. So you do you. However, be real with yourself. Be careful not to postpone dreams too long, holding off until your setup is just perfect. That might end up as a little bit of a quagmire for you. For us, it's been a five-year journey, so it doesn't always happen just overnight. Dropping everything just to run is not always the best solution for everyone, although you will consistently hear interview after interview after interview, just go do it. As you listen to this week's guest explain their overlanding vehicle of choice and their build-out strategy, you might want to replay it a few times, letting it truly sink in just how simple it truly could be. Destino Ushuaia, Jorge and his fiance did the Pan Am in such an impressive way with strong careers as marketing professionals. I'm sure they could have done things much differently. However, they intentionally chose simple. And from our point of view, they nailed it. Achieving their dreams of Ushuaia via a blend of a little bit of minivan, hiking, buses, and hitchhiking. And I think a couple plane rides here and there. Destino Ushuaia is a little bit of a tricky one. So if you have a hard time finding them on the Instagram, the links along with all the juicy details are in the show notes. Be sure to tag us on the social medias so we can see what kind of awesomeness you're up to. Hashtag GHT Overland. This episode is brought to you by GHT Overland. Please keep in mind, we'd love your support. Keeping all the algorithm spirits happy is kind of necessary. So if you wouldn't mind, at minimum, Level 1 Love is taking a second to leave a rating on iTunes or the podcast platform you listen on. Anything from a short little I like it to whatever you're feeling. Without constant love from you, we're just sludge at the bottom of a lost cold coffee cup. Level 2 Love is found on ghtoverland.com. This is where we maintain a list of recommended apps, books, and gear. Thank you to everyone who has used these links 
This also helps us earn a commission, costing you nothing extra. Level 3 Love is on Patreon. This is your opportunity to support the GHT Overland podcast with monthly little thank yous that help us pay web hosting fees, podcast hosting, and all the things that keep the podcast growing and improving. This is also how you get your hands on some sweet swag. Thank you for joining us as we pursue a renewed life mission of putting the best in people and nature on display while tackling the ugly Goliath of today by consistently placing positivity and respect for others in front of everything else. Welcome to the podcast, and thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to jump on a quick phone call. No, I really uh, thank you guys for the opportunity to share my experience with uh, your listeners and to future travels, because uh, sharing is uh, really important for, um, you know, the trip preparation, whatever trip you are looking forward to do. It's really important to have uh, as much information as you can. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm here to, to, to have fun with you guys during this uh, podcast. Well, hopefully we don't let you down. <laughs> <laughs> You're back home now, right? Yeah. I, uh, yes, right now we are, uh, we are in Canada. Canada is, became uh, a home since 2016. And uh, before we were living in Vancouver, then after our trip finished in uh, the end of 2019, we decided to to try uh, Montreal, which is the French-speaking part of Canada, since my my girlfriend is French, and uh, it's closer to Europe where our family actually live. Okay. And so we are we started living in Montreal since the beginning of 2020. Uh, yes, this is home now. Nice. So you and your girlfriend, you launched, you originally launched your adventure on the Pan Am when you lived in Vancouver, BC, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And what year was that you started? We we started the trip in June 2018. We made the decision to do the Panamericana road trip in uh, July 2017. So from the moment that we took the decision to, to to make this trip, we started doing research. We started approximate how much money it would have been needed to to do the trip. And uh, yeah, we understood that the amount, the money that you need for doing this sort of trip is obviously depend about several factors. One of the factors that for us was uh, crucial was the kind of vehicle that we were going to purchase for doing this trip. So we didn't want to invest too much money on that. And just to make it simple, at the end, uh, to make all the calculations by country, the 17 countries that we did with the car, it came out to around 27,000 per head meaning around 54,000 Canadian dollars for the entire trip for one year. You so you left in 2018 and then how long did it take you how long were you on the uh, on the road on the Pan American Highway? We initially planned to stay in the Pan American for one year. And uh, the budget was for that one only year. But uh uh, the trip started in Vancouver and then went up to Alaska. Coming down from Alaska, we stopped at the Rockies in uh, Banff. And uh, we found actually a, a job opportunity there. So we stayed in Banff for around two months working. So those two extra months of work made up for other six months of travel in South America. So we, oh, nice. at the end, ended up doing the trip for one year and a half, 18 months. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's super cool. So you decided to go north to the Arctic Circle first. 
And then it sounds like you came right. down, obviously through the Rockies. What was the rest? How did the rest of the West Coast look for you? Well, um, why we decided to to leave uh, Vancouver in at the end of May, at the beginning of June, is because of the weather. The weather uh, you want to reach uh, Alaska when it's not cold, obviously, and uh, as well going down. Uh, you need to plan ahead not to hit uh, Mexico during the storm season, the hurricane season. So you need, we decided to to travel along the weather. So uh, when we reach Banff in uh, the Canadian Rockies, we continue uh, down to following the Rockies until Yellowstone. And from Yellowstone, we... Uh, continue going down up to the up to Utah. In Utah, we did all the national parks in Utah, and then we came back towards the towards the ocean to California. And once we reached California, we continue going down up down to San Diego and did all Baja California Peninsula. Oh, nice, nice route. Yeah, is, Good selection. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, we did a lot of research why we decided to do Baja California instead of mainland Mexico. It's because it's safer and uh, calmer, meaning that uh, you will have less uh, less uh, theoretical incidents along the road. W- meanwhile, when you when people decided to do that to go the other way in mainland Mexico, there is more crowd there. And uh, it's a little bit more dangerous. So Baja California, we found it as a really good deal for us. And it's beautiful. So you ended up going through 17 countries. I think you did something close to 70,000 kilometers or 43,500 miles. I think that ends up being. But most eye-popping to us is you accomplished this in a minivan. Yes, correct. Yeah. So it was a funny fact uh, regarding the minivan because for doing this sort of trip, usually you need a bigger rig or a bigger transportation. And when we decided at the beginning to buy this little van is because we were really aware that at one point was a, it, 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 uh, supposed to break down. And so for us, was we spent little money invest in this little van to go up to Alaska and if it breaks down okay we leave it the car where it is you know and then uh, we continue the the road backpacking this was our original uh, idea um, for the reason when we built our setup was not for the entire trip was just for a short trip and uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, we had the luck to have this uh, little minivan that uh, lasted for the entire trip and uh, with no breakdowns. That's we crazy. Ever, ever changed it? We ever changed anything to the van? We just uh, changed the changed the, the the tires one in Colombia because obviously after so many kilometers they were run out. But uh, after then that. When I sold, uh, I resold the van actually <laughs> to, to other to another traveler, and uh, I changed the battery, and that was all, you know. And what and, was uh, it regarding the? Was it uh, a? I think it was a Freestar, a Ford Freestar. What year was it? Ford, Ford Freestar, two thousand six. Oh, it was one 4. year off. <laughs> it was close. That is absolutely crazy. What gave you the guts to do this trip in a 2006 Ford Freestar? Well, it's a funny story how we bought it because uh, <laughs> um, really, we you know how much we spent for that uh, minivan? We spent in Canadian dollars, uh, 3,000 Canadian dollars. So awesome. And... Uh, so to do the setup, meaning the, the, the bed uh, frame, we went to Home Depot. We rented the tools 
we bought the 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 the, the wood inside the the store, and we build it up outside the store. <laughs> oh. It took like uh, two hours to to do the bed frame, and that is all we did actually for <laughs> for the car. Oh you know, gosh, we put our amazing. things and we put our things, our backpacks, and uh, all the most important things that we bought for this trip under the mini under the bed frame, and that's it. We didn't have any 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 shower or any sort of, you know, uh, refrigerator, anything. We just uh, build that and that's it. To keep things refrigerated, we just have the little um, bags for keep things fresh for during the summer. You know, the <laughs> this uh, Costco little bags and that's it. Wow. So how many miles did it have on it when you bought it? How many miles? Uh, I can tell you in kilometers, it was uh, 180,000 kilometers around. Uh, yeah. That is so impressive. You do and realize, so, Jorge, that there's lots of people listening right now that are trying to build the perfect rig and they're waiting until everything is just perfect. And you bought a used... 2006 Ford Freestar minivan, you went to Home Depot, rented the tools, spent two hours, and said, it's good, let's go. <laughs> and you did the entire Pan-American uh, Highway. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much the story because, trust me, when when we did that setup, we thought that the car is supposed to break you know, going to Alaska, there is nothing there, and the car can break. Nobody's gonna save, uh, save you, and that's it. You know, you just uh, hope that uh, the car is gonna end up uh, in a, I don't know, somewhere where they keep the cars up there. But uh, and then we're supposed to go all the way up or down, uh, like uh, um, um, hijacking. You know? Yeah. I, I say you win the, the gold, the silver, and the bronze. <laughs> you get them all. It's <laughs> so impressive. Yeah, and the, the second part regarding the, our preparation is that we were really aware that we can lose absolutely everything at any time. Meaning that when we took our clothes or our more important values, we decided not to take them. We left pretty much everything in Vancouver. Regarding cloth, we had with us just the used cloth, you know, not nothing fancy, no jewelry, anything of that on that sort. And uh, the most important part for us were our documents, like a passport and things like this, that we always had with us in a um, in a in a in a little bag, you know. Uh, I don't remember in English the word, but uh, it's the little bag that you had in your belly. Okay. Yeah, like a fanny pack. And we always had the documents there, you know, but we were really aware that uh, we could lo lose everything at any moment. So for us, it was uh, a fair deal, not to invest too much money in anything, because we could, we could lose it any time. Even our phones, you know, we, we left our nice phones at uh, in Vancouver, and we were just traveling with, uh, it was uh, about, I remember, an iPhone 6, paid, used it, $150, and we did the entire trip with that. For the reason that are uh, we even a camera, we had a used camera that we used for the trip, and we knew that you know at one point something was going to to happen to that camera, so we didn't care properly. <laughs> was there any name that you've given the van? Oh yes, Torito. Torito means um, a small bull. Small. Why? Bull. Because after. <laughs> That's awesome. Because, because after few 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 kilometers that we started with Torito, to, uh, with the car, the car still didn't have a name. But we saw it really resistant. It was doing really performing really well, and uh, since it was little, we call it uh, Little Bull. You know, Torito. That is great. So let's go through a few little details on that amazing little bull van. 
Um, how much fuel would it carry and how far would that generally take you? That, uh, so with a few, uh, full tank, the minivan used to make in a straight, in a straight trip up to 800 kilometers. Okay. Yeah, 800 kilometers. And at, the, at that time, the price per liter, I can tell you, in and this is where the all-important record button was unknowingly unactivated. So there's that. So much for looking up conversions from metric to imperial during an interview. Multitasking fails again. Our apologies. Luckily, we caught it in time, so no worries. What we missed is the details on their setup, like fuel, water, meals, daily routines, a lot of really good information. So to get these details, jump on over to the show notes at ghtoverland.com. Everything is there. Much thanks to Jorge. Nonetheless, it seems a good time to let you know we're going to be adding a little mid-interview break to pay some bills. We appreciate you hanging tight, and we will be right back. Perfect. Yeah. So one... Two of my favorite places uh, along the entire Panamericana road trip. First one was Alaska because of the vastness and the wilderness that there is uh, in Alaska. I, we, I never expected to, to be so alone, I must say. So, uh, the solitude and the animals that come towards you there is amazing. It's, uh, Incredible. It's really powerful as well because, you know, we were in some places doing wild camping for days with no humans around and we just going hiking and meeting animals all around. And it was just, wow, you know, it's really, really felt like in the movie Into the Wild at one point. But uh, that part really touched me because I, I was... I was not expecting something like that. I, yeah, maybe I said, I, it's going to happen a little bit, but uh, no. Then when you are in Alaska, you realize how big is Alaska. You you realize it because you start going around with your uh, with your with your car, and uh, you just will see how many kilometers you are doing. And so you will be miscalculating when you what you at the beginning maybe foreseen to do with your car. So plan ahead on time and on uh, resources because Alaska is big and you will need more resources than expected to do that. The second one is uh, the northern part of Argentina, which for us was a total surprise. Um, passing, crossing the, the first border from uh, um, from Chile to Argentina, you will find uh, an amazing, an amazing scenery. There is a, there are the, 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 the Andes Cordillera will drop of 1,000 meters in few kilometers, and you will touch uh, a scenery that is out of this world, colored mountains, and there is uh, proper cultures down there that uh, have a, and thousands of, of years of history, and uh, they have excellent wine, which we love it. <laughs> and it's not uh, really expensive. We were we were ending up paying for a bottle in a winery, even one dollar and fifty. You know, and thanks to the dollar being so strong right now, it's a really good deal. So we had a really good time in that part of Argentina. A dollar fifty for a bottle of wine. Yes, correct. We we once paid that amount in a, in a winery. Well, heck, we let's get actually, to <laughs> not, not, not only that, in that winery we did the winery tour where there has no fee. We we made a wine tasting and we bought one bottle of wine at one dollar fifty. That's amazing. So it was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. That's great. So yeah. what is um what do you think was the number one biggest challenge you had to overcome during your trip? 
Well, the biggest challenge per se was that um, bad experience with the uh, with the rot, the blockade that we had in Oaxaca, in which my girlfriend got scared when the people, the locals, people trying to they were moving the car, you know, like uh, if you don't pay, we're gonna hurt you, and uh, for me to see her in that way was a little bit uh, scary but I needed to keep myself you know strong so I I, I I managed the situation in a safe way I pay what I needed to pay which was like a hundred pesos few dollars but other than that uh, we never had any complication during the trip luckily yeah I must say because uh, you know I I saw so many, so many rigs of cars, uh, you know, breaking down, and uh, we were so lucky to have uh, this uh, small Torito or little bang that never broke down. So for us, it was uh, really a relief. And uh, actually, the I think that for travelers, obviously, is home our our transportation, and uh, to have. That little, uh, that little minivan that never broke down I was uh, really, really, really lucky for us to have it. Yeah, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, and was that, just curious, the blockade that you ran across in Oaxaca, was that the only one that you came across? Yes, it was the only one. Yes. Yes. Okay. Because once, once that we were in, uh, in Mexico, there is, another state which is kind of uh, kind of dangerous it's called uh, Chiapas maybe you heard about it it's really close to Oaxaca just uh, south of Oaxaca and uh, there is a, actually a revolutionary army there uh, the Zapatista army maybe you heard about them and so in in the some centers in uh, Chiapas there are blockades and there are two particular roads that are not really advised to drive through. One is from uh, San Cristobal de las Casas, that is one of the most beautiful places in Chiapas. It's a must visit if you are in Chiapas. And uh, there is the road 199 that you don't need, you, it's better not to take. Because there, there are normally really bad blockage there and uh, actually some people ended up dead so because of the, there were some um, some unfortunate guys that uh, didn't want to pay the, the toll and the people became really violent and uh, they ended up bad you know so mm -hmm. this is one of the most concerning from the uh, road from the point of stand standpoint of traveling in uh, Chiapas and uh, yes we avoid it so if you come across a blockade and they're pretty aggressive in pushing the car to pay 100 pesos which is about just over 450 US probably pay the 5 bucks and just move along yeah so one important thing is that you never have to carry too much cash in you never never you just need to cash to carry the cash that you need. This is one thing. You can show them how much money you have. You can say, I have just this. I can give you just that. You know? And that is the so they will they will say, It's fine, give me what you have. And they are gonna leave you alone, you know. Got and it. just don't uh, don't have too much cash in you, never. In Latin America never. At least this is what we what how it works for us, you know. And uh, another thing is uh, regarding traveling is that do not travel during the during the night. After that, after dusk, do not travel. Travel just during the day. Yeah, sounds like a smart move. From uh, from Mexico onwards, we never had the problem. Problems that uh, we had were normally during the late hours, during the night. Ah, if I I have to say another bad experience that we had, it was as well in Mexico. We were in uh, Jalisco, where is tequila, tequila 
the, the city from. We were actually in tequila in the city. And uh, during the night, we went to the festival of tequila. There, there, was a per, there was around those days. So when we came back to our car, we were sleeping inside the city, just along the, you know, the, in front of the houses. And during the night, one guy uh, broke inside the car, opened the car and broke inside the car. I was sleeping behind and I saw this guy inside, right? So I jumped into him. They, luckily, he didn't have any, any weapon or anything. So I asked him, what are you doing here? And uh, he said, what are you doing here? I didn't see anybody because we had uh, the panels that, you know, for, that kept us uh, warm. We use it as well, you know, to not let anybody to see inside the car. And so he, didn't, he was not aware that we were there. And so after speaking uh, for, a, for a few minutes, the guy left. It was like a four in the morning. And the guy came back a few minutes after, 20 minutes after, asking to open the window. We were, we were scared, obviously. And uh, we opened the window, and he said, I can't let you stay here this night, but you need to pay. Otherwise, the boss is going to be angry. And at that point, uh, we say, you know what? We think about it. We don't have any money. And we took the car, and we left. It was like already 5 in the morning. And uh, we went to stay close to the police station because sometimes when you are running out of time in Mexico or in anywhere in Central and South America, if you want to be safe, it's safer to sleep in front of the police station. Eventually, the the fire workers or the the hospital, you know, somewhere where you can be protected. But uh, that was the second, uh, the second uh, time in which we were a little bit scared and concerned regarding our safety. Yeah. And can you find the local police station on iOverlander? Or did you yeah, use maps for me? Of course. Oh, no, you can find it in iOverlander, or it's better, you know, if you find it on maps me, which we were uh, we were using. You just write, type police station, and they will find uh, something for you. And you will navigate, you know, for you. Excellent tips. Uh, what worked for you guys at managing laundry and hygiene? Hygiene. Well, uh, regarding clothes, uh, we were uh, using uh, laundry services all the time. In every city where we stop, we used to just uh, to, to, to do our laundry there. And uh, we never had a problem, actually, in the entire Panamericana. There are laundry services in any medium to big city size, you know, and uh, we never had a problem on this regard. And then uh, regarding ourselves, we were washing ourselves um, in uh, taking showers in the national parks, camping areas, um, in some, uh, some little ports. There are showers for the fishermen. We were using those as well. Um, if not, when you are properly in the wild, we will just go in towards a lake or uh, a river. And uh, for other hygienical needs, we were using always gas stations, uh, national parks, visitor centers. Yeah, that, that that's it. You know, pretty pretty. For, I mean, for us, it was really pretty easy because in the morning we used to wake up doing our, for example, in, the, in North America, our wild camping, taking our coffee. And obviously, with, you can wash yourself with a small, uh, small uh, little tank, you know, or water container. And for us, it was enough. If you need, to warm what, uh, you need to warm some water, we're just warming up the water with our little, uh, little stove the one that we used to cook because to cooking for cooking we had those uh, little stuff that sell for doing camping you know the the little stuff when there is one single can so like we were using jet boil. To cook. yes exactly and uh, we were using that little stuff to cook for us and uh, we were using that as well if we needed to warm some water to wash ourselves eventually we were just warming up water on that 
Okay, cool. So what else, if you were to kind of lay out your kitchen setup, what did that look like? You had the jet boil. What else did you take with you to be able to cook meals on the road? Okay, so we had uh, two boxes. One was for plates and cooking uh, hardware. You know, the all these little things, we bought them in Dollarama, for example, just not spending much. And the second one was to keep our dry food essentials, pasta, rice, um, could be like a salt, all these, uh, all these dry food essentials. And for our fresh food essentials, we were using the before mentioned uh, um, cooling bag. So all the fruits and vegetables were in this cooling bag. And uh, yeah, that's it. And we were cooking everything inside uh, with this uh, this small stove. Okay, cool. So you had like, did you have like one pan and like one set of dishes for each of you? Yeah, exactly. We have we have one pan, one uh, one little uh, bowl, one uh, one small bowl just for warming some water. We we had uh, two plates, two glasses, <laughs> uh, one knife, you know, one uh, one. Um, one pair of every single thing that you need to cook. Nothing, uh, nothing fancy. Just essential. That's awesome, man. And everything simple. Fit, everything, every exactly everything fit inside one these plastic uh, containers. You know that we bought to keep under the bed, and so we have these two two boxes under the bed, and uh, you know you just manage to make it logistically easy to access from the bed. And uh, sorry, from the from the car, and that's uh, that's how it worked. So nothing really complicated. Meaning that uh, us uh, for us uh, to even to to do our backpacking trips in the that we did previously to do the Pan American road trip, the lightest we are, the better it is. So nothing really fancy or complicated. Something something not, just has to be useful. And. What was your favorite meal that you made on the road? I was cooking uh, often, and uh, I'm a, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, I, I'm a Peruvian Italian, but on the side of cooking, I'm a totally Italian, meaning that I was cooking a lot of pastas. And so I used to make a pasta with zucchini and pesto, or I may say with, uh, it's our primary, uh, my favorite meal with some uh, Parmesan cheese that keep uh, a little bit longer for uh, as a food. And so this was uh, the fastest and uh, tastiest food that I can advise to cook <laughs> during the trip because it takes a really not so long to cook. And other, other, other than that, uh, all kind of pastas. But we never cook anything fancy because the most uh, gas you spend on, on the little stuff, the most are you're going to spend on gas. And it's another cost. For even on this aspect, we were saving money. All the time that we needed to cook, we were cooking for just not one meal, but even for the day after maybe. It's awesome. Let's go over border crossings. How long did border crossings normally take for you and any tips that you have for uh, for doing border crossings? Okay. Regarding borders, you you need to prepare your your trip well in advance, meaning that you need to take a look if you will require any visa previously to travel. If you need to take a look if your passport is going to expire soon, you will need to replace it. All of these aspects regarding visa, I advise strongly to take a look beforehand to be in front of the border. Otherwise, you don't want to be stuck with a passport that is going to expire and want to pass the border. Otherwise, it's going to take you forever. So this is the first tip that I must advise. And once that you have all of these aspects under control and you actually are physically before crossing the border, you just need to prepare the paperwork regarding what you need. Most of this information 
is already in I over lambda. So you need to you need to take a look to the to the latest comments and what is needed to pass the border because they will ask you pretty much always the same information. And uh, in North America regarding traveling, when I say North North America is Canada and US, you need just one insurance to travel to in, in these two countries. And uh, as soon as you touch Mexico and going downwards, you will need an insurance for every single country. Usually in some countries you can pay online your insurance before arriving at the border and you just can print in advance the, the proof of, of insurance and with that you go to the border and say, you know what, my car is on my name and I have the insurance and all of these things. And another thing that you need for sure to prepare before crossing the border is to make copies of every single thing. At least three copies of your driving license, of your car registry and certificate, your insurance, and then your uh, your passport. At least three copies. I mean, we, for example, made uh, at least 15 copies before leaving because we knew regarding this. But uh, other than that as well, you may need to change some money to pay with local currencies in uh, in Central America. You can do it on site, meaning that there are people that are going to ch exchange money for you. So you just exchange what you need because the cost of exchange at the border is obviously more expensive, at least in 95% of the cases. You just exchange what you need and then you pay and uh, that's it. So, so the fees change from country to country, but they're not really exaggerated. Um, one country that asks you for a kind of deposit when you arrive is Mexico. You, you can take back this money when you leave the country. Because for them, the important part is that with the card that you get in, you get out. So they make you pay kind of a lot of money to to let you in, but as soon as uh, you leave the country, they reimburse you this money, for example, through your credit card, you pay through credit card. But uh, normally it never took us more than uh, one day of preparation before a border crossing, because we already had everything, uh, everything arranged in advance. Is there any specific border experiences that stand out to for our listeners could learn from? No, 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 you just go directly to, there, there will be people offering services for you to to help you to do the paperwork. I mean, uh, it's, it's not difficult, meaning that you just need to go straight and you say, you know, I need to cross the border, you need to learn maybe these few phrases in Spanish, if they don't speak it, uh, English, but they know you that you are foreigner, that you are going, you want to pass. So let, they will tell you, they will indicate you which is the right office and you just need to, to to show the papers that I told you, you know. You don't need anybody to, to do the paperwork for you. Normally there are people that offer it, they offer these services. You just say, no, no necesito, which is I don't need it. No? And you try to do it yourself because sometimes these guys uh, are, uh, are taking a lot of money from uh, foreigners. So it's, uh, my advice is you may try to do it yourself because it's uh, not really complicated. You know, and actually in Ayoverlanda, there is step by step what to do, in which office you need to go, what is right and everything. So there are a lot of travelers that already did it. So I think that uh, you must check just on Ayoverlanda, which is the update, and where is the updated uh, situation on border crossing. And uh, yeah, don't be, one thing for sure is you don't need to be afraid of border crossing. Unless, Unless you have, uh, you have, uh, for example, a drone in Nicaragua or Costa Rica, and they don't allow drones. So that uh, that is a, a different aspect that you need to know how to manage. Or uh, you have, uh, for example, animals, and you may need certificates for these animals. Right. So every single case is different. But um, if you don't have animals and you don't carry weapons or 
or drum or something that is normally inside the list of the of the of the border that they don't allow in the country, you are good to go. But normally, there, all of this information is available. So you need to to be aware that what they are uh, allowing and what they are not allowing inside the country. For example, in Chile, in Chile they they don't allow any sort of uh, any sort of fruits and vegetables. So you need to get rid of those before before passing. In some countries, they doing other don't. So just take a look what are the requirements, and uh, yeah, but they are just, you just need to check this one day before, maybe two, if you want to consume all the or the food that you have, and they are not allowing one country. Okay, and then you mentioned um, insurance a little bit ago. What either personal or health insurance did you guys use, and any tips on vehicle insurance as well? So we we were using. Uh, a um, a French company called Chapka, because we were both um, of European citizens. This company was for European travelers, maybe, and was well, meaning that covers you in all the countries in the world, pretty much, almost all. And uh, an important uh, emergency that you have, you are covered, and as well as in case of repatriation. I know that this is an aspect uh, that is not really interesting, but it's important that I mention this because it's happened that several times, uh, unfortunately, some travelers pass away during the trip because you don't want to f- your family to take uh, care of the situation, right? So it's better to be covered on this regard. So the one that we use for sure is Chapka. And I can advise it because I use it a couple of times for for dental emergencies. And they reimburse me pretty right away. I just need to prove that you went to a clinic, and uh, they you need to send them the invoice, and that's it. How they process it was pretty straightforward. We paid uh, more than a thousand, I guess, for both of us euros for one year. Uh, car insurance, as I mentioned before, in North America, U.S. and Canada, is fine. The one that you have, if you are traveling from in North America. For, for from any state is fine. It will cover you for Canada and US. But in Mexico, you need to purchase it in advance. There are several online companies that can uh, do the work. You just need to 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 insert your your uh, information, and then you will have your insurance pretty pretty fast. When you go down to Belize, for example, in Belize. In every, in every country is going to be different. For example, in Belize, you can buy your insurance directly at the border. So in the border, you will pass the border, you will tell them, I will need insurance. The border will indicate you one office, which is not that far from the border, for example, between uh, Quintana Roo and Mexico and Belize, and uh, you will buy the insurance on spot. And this may happen as well in other countries like Nicaragua or, or, or Costa Rica, I think. In, in some countries, you will buy them on the spot. In others, you need to purchase them in advance. But uh, insurance-wise, it's not really complicated. So on um, what is your best advice to other couples like you and your girlfriend spending so much time inches from each other 24-7? Uh, this is the cabin fever, my friend. This, uh, <laughs> you know that we, we were working a lot before the trip. Okay, we were working a lot. We were not seeing each other often because we had to pretty much two jobs both to in order to save money. You no, know? and uh, when that date, that trip date came, we were like a little bit like a, annoying each other again. Uh, so we spent the first week a little bit in a, in a weird mood, both of us. We made a big fight about every single aspect that we didn't like from each other after the first uh, 10 days. Eh? And then one, after the, this first fight, we we put everything out there, what we don't like from each other, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And from this day, everything went perfect. I think that in order to, to have a nice trip, you need to be aware of all the defects of the other person. In our minivan, trust me, it was a really, really small environment. For us living there, you need to know the other person 100%. The facts and uh, nice things. 
and this is what uh, we we actually did start uh, we were doing it along the way and uh, you need to agree that uh, some things sometimes will not be anything is perfect and you just need to work on them you know when something is not uh, doesn't like you you need to tell uh, to, to the other person or if you, at one point you are really outside your head you just go for a walk eh? because you are doing a, a road trip right <laughs> you park the car you go walking yes. and that's it you can be relaxed. You go for a nice hike. Yeah, yes, exactly. So you need to reach compromise, I think, you know, beforehand. Otherwise, uh, you will say goodbye to each other after a few thousand miles. Yikes! <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably want to avoid that. No, exactly. I mean, just you know, to be sincere, to be fair, to to make to 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 try to make it work. So for us, it was important. Uh, what do you think your average monthly cost was for fuel cost, which I assume was your your biggest cost? Yeah, and um, so it depends about the, the country where you travel. In, obviously, the, regarding gas, you're going to spend more in Canada and U.S. In Canada, our daily expense, everything, we had like a hundred, no, wait, six. Canadian dollars per day, more or less, that covers absolutely everything. Because uh, you need to make your uh, your uh, your calculations regarding the whole kilometers road that you're going to to cover in this country, how many days you're going to stay in this country, and so you need to divide the meals that you're going to need. And so this is what, what we usually did for every single country. And uh, U.S. and Canada were obviously the most expensive countries because of the kilometers and because of the cost of, uh, of food. Uh, keeping in mind that we never paid for accommodation. No, yes, we almost never pay for accommodation. So if you add camping fees or any sort of accommodation fees, your price is going to pop up really, really high because actually in North America is a higher part of the of the trip is accommodation. You can go to a hotel, motel, and even campings. I mean, for example, campings in certain national parks is up to forty dollars sometimes, from twenty to, from twenty to forty dollars. If you're lucky. No, you, that's too much. Need, yeah, yeah, exactly. And we were doing for this one while camping. Imagine that you you want to spend uh, one month doing camping in uh, in the west part of, uh, you know, BC or Alberta, and you need to pay at least $25 per day. So it's, that is a high cost at the end, you know. But if you don't need to pay for it, you are just kind of uh, better on finances, right? It sounds like for Canada and probably the U.S., you estimate prob- all total probably about 60 Canadian a day which is going to be about 47, 48 uh, U.S. dollars a day. And that would cover your budget for both fuel, uh, food, other miscellaneous things. Correct. Okay. And then once you got into, let's say, Baja, California or Central America, do you think that that dropped down, if it was 60 Canadian, maybe to... 40 or 50 Canadian? What do you think it would have been? In Mexico, it's uh, less expensive for sure regarding uh, regarding food. Do you think that Central America and South America were roughly the same? From, for the gas price standpoint, it's pretty much the same everywhere. I can tell you this. Okay. We changed that few cents, so don't be don't be too much uh, concerned about that. Maybe there is just one country in which you spend less money than all the others, which is Ecuador. Yep. Okay. Why? Because uh, because the government uh, helps people for for put the gas at the pumps, so you will pay you will pay less money there. But other than that, in all the countries, it's pretty much the same. Uh, regarding food. Uh, as soon as you hit Mexico, the price for food is going to be less. 
in supermarkets or in local markets, but even in Mexico is still higher than or the other Central Americas or Latin Am or South American countries. So, for example, uh, let's say that you you are in Peru and you want to go eating at a local restaurant you will spend uh, seven soles, which is like uh, like uh, right now two dollars, two US dollars for a meal. I mean, it depends about the restaurant, but I'm saying the restaurant where, I, where we used to go, which is kind of uh, normal for for um, for average people in Peru. So you just go to eat there for two dollars and two dollars, two dollars and a half per meal. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> in, amazing. In Canada, to have a, even a a subway, you need to pay at least ten dollars. You know, that's that's uh, the difference, yeah. right? Yeah, there's a uh, huge difference. Yeah. Okay, Jorge. During your trip with you and your girlfriend, what if anything really restored your faith in humanity? I mean, I, for me, it was all the kindness that there are in people out there. You know, when I I really love to 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 meet new people and uh, in Latin America starting from Mexico you will have you will find really really beautiful humans out there that uh, they don't mind about your money they don't mind about anything uh, uh, material right uh, they just want to know you they they want to smile to you to to see you you know to to know to know who you are knowing the the locals and you know, fill you up and feed you with a nice spark of life. This is my advice. What advice would you give your ten-year younger self? Okay, that's uh, that's uh, that's a interesting question. Uh, I would say, I would say uh, to leave Europe before. In my situation, go to explore because uh, there is nothing you have to be afraid of. If you could put any message on every billboard in Canada, what would that be? You must go. The road is waiting for you. Mm. Nice. There you go. All right, Jorge, anything that we've missed? I think that we cover pretty much all the aspects of, uh, of the, the trip. And uh, if anybody wants to ask uh, any advice or any, any tip regarding Latin America, you know, they just can reach out to me through social media. And, uh, yeah, we have two accounts in Instagram and Facebook with uh, the Sinoshuaya as her name. Um, it's just to give uh, people advices on travel and to inspire people to travel. And uh, if anybody wants to to reach uh, out to me, I will be happy to to reply and to give you guys tips. From your social media account to your website, how did you come up with that name? Um, it was actually the, the 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 name given by my girlfriend, Ushuaia, because it was our final destination. And uh, destino, destination in Spanish, like a destination. Destino, because uh, we wanted to end up there, and uh, we found that really, uh, really nice name. And there was no name taken yet with this uh, with this project, so we just went for it. Yeah, it's really good. Love it. So let's wrap it up with some fun facts about you. What is your favorite genre of music? And between you and your girlfriend, who is the better singer between the two of you? Well, I must say, we both, both like uh, rock. So uh, I think that I'm a little bit a better singer, but when I, I, I sing Spanish songs, <laughs> not English. So when I, I, I sing uh, romantic Spanish songs, she just uh, melts. And so she's oh, happy. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> What's a favorite drink in the morning to get you going? Coffee. Uh, coffee. A nice black coffee for me is uh, is more than essential. It's just uh, there is no good morning without a black coffee for me. <laughs> and a favorite beverage at night to wind down after a long day? Well, I'm... Uh, 
I can uh, divide myself in two aspects here. I, I like chamomile. <laughs> so I, I like to go, before going to sleep, I take chamomile. Speak. Or I, I, when I with some with some friends, sometimes I some uh, some rum, you know, rum, some you know, like <laughs> aged rum. There you go. What's your best advice to aspiring overlanders and adventure enthusiasts listening right now? They need to obviously check when the, what is the current situation in every in every. In every city, in every state where they go, because obviously with COVID, uh, everything changes, and uh, we just need to be more more uh, patient, but uh, more aware of uh, what a situation can be in uh, a specific uh, geographical place. On the same point of travel, I I would like you know advise everybody that uh, they 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 need to go for it. They just don't. To be afraid to wait, because uh, we never know, you know, when is going to be the last opportunity to travel. So it's better to take advantage of our decision of the today, and uh, that our world is so beautiful out there, and uh, they just need to explore it. And above all, our countries here, Canada, the U.S., and Latin America, is uh, we are blessed to have. Uh, such a beautiful environment. So please go and explore. All right. So let's cover again real quick how people can connect with you just to make sure that we've got that clear. So Destino Ushuaia, could you spell that for our listeners just to make sure that they can connect to you? And that's going to be the same, I think, yeah, for yeah. your website, for Instagram and Facebook, right? Correct. And, well, it's Destino Ushuaia. So, as we said, Ushuaia was our destination, being the the, sound, the southern city in the in the in the American continent. So, I know this is a it's a funny pronunciation, but I hope you guys uh, will find out how to type it, which is Destino Ushuaia. Yep, that is great. So D E S T I N O U S H U A I A. And you can connect with Jorge both on, you've got a great website, social media, Instagram seems to be the primary for you, and then Facebook as well. Any more information you'd like to give or useful resources that our listeners should check out? Um. Well, in the website, I will actually introduce more travel material, like uh, how much was our average spent per per, per country, or these uh, you know important facts for travel, just to have an idea. Obviously, they they will need to check which is the current situation for all of these aspects, and uh, yes, they can take inspiration or or you know take, they can take a look at what we did, and if not replicate it, just to have an idea. That's perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Safe travels and adventures to you. A remote cheers to you as we look forward to our overlanding paths, hopefully crossing again sometime in person. I, w- I would love that. I would love that. And thank you very much for having me at your podcast. I really, really enjoy the time here, you know, with you guys. And I wish you a really, really wonderful travel and uh, so many beautiful experiences for you too. Oh, that's amazing. Thanks, man. We really, uh, we've really enjoyed talking with you. We really enjoy talking with, uh, with everyone else that has these experiences. And we are very excited to hit the road and get going. So again, thank you for spending your, uh, your time with us. You've been very patient, very nice, and very giving of your time. So we greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, guys. Have a wonderful weekend.